Hello and welcome to ECMATH. In this video we're going to explore some double input transformations. Uh, before what you watch this video, you should make sure that you're comfortable with all the parent functions, all of the basic transformations, and sequences of transformations where there's perhaps one input x transformation and a number of y transformations. And just as a quick recap of kind of what we are going to be looking at, uh, or what we expect you to be able to do, let's do a quick recap and graph uh, one half negative x to the third minus three. So if we're doing this, the first thing to observe is that the parent graph is y equals x cubed. I would plot some points from that parent graph. Uh, then I'll look at what the transformations are. So I know the negative here means we reflect over the y-axis. I know that this one-half means we divide all y values by 2. And this 3 means we move down 3 units. So uh, to do that in a sequence, we could first reflect over the y-axis. So it, it will then be going down. like that. Uh, we would then shrink all the y values by 2. Uh, so that would have been at 8. It's now going to be at 4. And these look really similar, but it you can tell from the specific y values that it has been uh, sort of squished down. And then everything would shift down 3 units. We'll do that will be the completed graph. So we'll do everything down three units. And the graph would look something like this. This is harder than it looks. I'm doing two pieces. That's just a recap of sequences transformations. Uh, if any of that is unfamiliar to you, this is not the video for you to watch. You should go back and look at some previous content, look at your class notes, come back here when you're ready to do, uh, you're fully confident in problems like that because we are now going to turn up the difficulty level. So in this video, we are going to show a method for computing uh, the result when you have multiple input transformations. We're going to explain why you need to do it this way and at the end, I'll show you an alternative method that you can use that I think is personally a little easier. Uh, so here's the issue. Um, I have the graph 1 half x minus 1 quantity cubed. And we can look at this and say, aha, I see two transformations here. This is going to be a horizontal stretch. Because remember that we divide all the x values by 1 half, so that's going to have the effect of stretching it. And this is going to be a horizontal shift to the right, because it's negative. We have that x minus c giving us a shift to the right. So pause and think for a second, where does that graph sit? And when I guess I mean like, where's the inflection point of that graph? That's originally at 0, 0. Where does that move to? You might think it would move to 1. And then the graph would move to 1 because of the x minus 1 and then be stretched out a little bit by the horizontal stretch. But if you actually look at this on a calculator, you see that the inflection point of this graph actually sits right here at 2. Here's 1. So how in the world does a graph with a shift of what appears to be a shift of 1 move to over to x equals 2? And how can we have a system for making this like actually work in practice uh, when we have these multiple inputs? Here's why that graph moved to an unexpected place. Uh, the reason is that when you have an input transformation and you're doing, you know, you have a plus or minus, uh, you have a coefficient and you have a shift, you could have, you know, one, two, or even all three of those. Uh, you should do them in this order. Horizontal shift first, then you can do the stretch or shrink, and then the last thing you do could be the reflection. 
Uh, it's actually technically true that you can do these two steps in either order, but it's really important that the shift happen first. Now, if we do the shift first, I'll show you how you get the exact correct graph. So I'm still doing a cubic graph. So the parent is x cubed. It'll look like this. I would shift over by 1, which would put me over here. It would look like this. And now I'm going to do this horizontal stretch. I'm going to divide all the x values by 1 half, which means I'm really going to multiply all the x values by 2. But let's look very carefully at where the x values now are. The point that was the inflection point is now at x equals 1. So when I stretch that, that's going to actually move over to x equals 2. The point up here that was at x equals 2, it's going to have its x value doubled as well and actually move over to x equals 4. The only point that won't move is the point that was at x equals 0. That point stays put. That's how you do the stretch. You imagine kind of that the graph is fixed at that 0 point and you're pulling it from the 0 point outward. The final graph should hit these three points looks something like this. I know it's probably not quite so flat in the middle um, but let's compare that to what the calculator said. Yeah, it's a little flatter on the calculator. That's just a scale thing. Um, the graph goes, hits 2, has its inflection point, and then goes back up. This one also had no reflections, but if there was a reflection, uh, we could have done that in the last step to reflect the whole graph over the y-axis. So that's how this graph ends up at 2, because you first shift and then you stretch, but when you're stretching, you're actually stretching the part that you shifted as well, which causes movement that you might not expect in a graph. All right, the next graph will be, uh, next example will be square root of negative x plus 4. And we're still going to work in the order of shift, stretch, reflect. This one has a shift uh, by 4 units to the left because it's my, uh, plus 4 means it's a shift to the left and then it has a reflect over y that's what the negative on the x does it's important to do it in this order we're going to do the shift first uh, so parent graph of square root that's the, actually the first thing is draw your parent graph shift 4 units over I'm going to shift, it's good to shift a number of points so you can get the curve right, like this. And then we're going to reflect over the y-axis. But let's think about really carefully what happens when you reflect over the y-axis. You take the opposite of all x values. That's what the negative on the x means. So when I was over here at negative 4, that's going to map when I reflect all the way over to 4. When I was at negative 3, that's going to map all the way over to 3. The only point, as before, that won't move is when x was 0. So the point from negative 4 moved over to 4, and that had a y of 0. The point from negative 3 moved over to 3, that had a y of 1. And the point with a 0 didn't move at all. So the square root graph is going to be pointing to the left, but actually starting over in the first quadrant. If when you first saw this equation, uh, what some people think is that it's going to be, if they're not thinking about the order, I should say, uh, they might say, oh, well, it's going to be reflected first and then shifted four, and they get a graph that looks something like this, which is like the right shape and the right direction, but it doesn't start in the right place and it lives in the wrong quadrants. So it does, is in fact true that the order matters, and doing the transformations in this specific order is the best way to get your result. Here's our third example. So the parent is absolute value of x. 
and we have three transformations going on. We're going to talk shift, stretch, and then reflect. So we're going to be shifting uh, six units to the left. We're going to be dividing all x's by two, and then we're going to reflect over the y-axis, or take the opposite of all the x's. So this is three transformations, and we do are going to do them in that order that I just listed. Uh, the parent is absolute value. So draw kind of a nice little V. Let's shift this six units over. One, two, three, six. And draw another V. I'm going to put some specific points on this V because I'm about to divide those X's by two. So I really want to have some like specific values here. So this was at six. I'm going to mark four and eight also. Uh, negative, negative, and negative. Ah, put negative two on. So if I'm now going to do this shrink and divide all the X's by two, all the x values need to get divided by 2, and negative 6 is going to map back to negative 3. Negative 4 is going to map back to negative 2. It's being divided by 2. And the point that was at negative 8 is going to map back to negative 4. I'm dividing all the x values by 2. Uh, uh, those, have, those two points had a y of 2. Oh, there's some overlap between the two graphs. That's okay. That can happen. So I've shrunk the graph. But as it shrinks, the only point that doesn't change is the zero point. Every other point shrinks back in, like a spring attached to the y-axis again when you compute that shrink. Now we can reflect over the y-axis. I'm going to move all three of these points just to the other side. So I need a 3 a 4, and a 2. There was the vertex at 3, over 2 and up 2, over 2 and up 2. We can complete the absolute value graph. Not quite right. There. Uh, so that's the final graph. And we use a sequence of transformations to arrive at this. And again, the caution is that you really do have to do them in this order. If you don't do the transformations in that specific order, you're probably going to end up in the wrong quadrant, or you're probably going to end up with the wrong size of shift. Maybe you'd end up in quadrant one, but over here at six, uh, or maybe you'd end up at three, like where the green graph is. You'd be in the in the uh, the right size of the shift, but the wrong quadrant. So it really is important to watch out for that order. Uh, you might be wondering why why do the shifts behave this way? Why do we have to do it in this specific order? Um, so here is a little bit of an explanation, and I hope it makes sense. It may not immediately make sense to you. You might have to sit with this idea for a little bit before you can really lock it in, and that's okay. It's fine to just do the procedure for a little bit, and then as you graph more and more of these, you'll start to understand why it works just mechanically. Um, you don't always have to understand why right away, although it's nice to understand why at some point, of course. So why does it work this way? And we're going to use the last two graphs as examples. So the parent of that first graph was y equals absolute value of x. And absolute value has this specific shape, and it has this turning point right at 0, 0. Specifically, that's from the point where the absolute value of 0 equals 0. That exact situation um, is what causes this graph to turn around. So when you have a transformation, that turning point is going to happen whenever the inside of your function the inside of the absolute value bars is equal to zero. So to actually find that exact point, you could set an equation. You could set the argument of the function. The thing inside a function is called the argument. Now we've talked about that term before. You could set that argument equal to zero. And it would look like this. Negative 2x plus 6 equals zero. And then you could solve it. Now let's solve this very carefully. I'm going to pay attention to the steps. Um, we need to get rid of the constants first. So I'm going to take away 6 from both sides. And then we get negative 2x 
is equal to negative 6. Then we can divide by negative 2. We can divide by negative 2. And then we get our x is equal to 3. Hey, wait a minute. In the graph that we just produced, the transform graph, where did the vertex end up? The correct version of the vertex. It ended up at 3. So actually, setting the argument equal to 0 is a correct way to find the mapped location of the vertex. Um, or if your graph doesn't have a vertex, like it's a, a cube root, or a cube or a cube root, you can find the inflection point in the same way. Um, so we can use this solving procedure to locate that vertex. That's why the vertex ends at 3. But more specifically, let's look at the order we just did this in. We did the minus 6 first, right? That's the shift. Then we did the division by negative 2. That's the stretch and the reflection. So because the reason that we do our transformations in that order is it's that, that it's the same order we would solve the equation backwards in order to find the location of the vertex. Let's apply the same procedure to the graph that we did uh, before the last one, uh, square root of negative x plus 4. So I can set the argument equal to 0. That argument's the thing under the root. So I can say, okay, negative x plus 4 is equal to 0. And take away 4 from both sides. That's doing the shift. We can get negative x equals negative 4. We can now divide by negative 1 or multiply by negative 1. doesn't really matter. And we get x equals 4, which is, if you remember from that graph, the location of that vertex point, right? It was at 4 and then it opened this way. So by setting the argument equal to zero, you can tell where the inflection point or the vertex or the starting point of your graph is gonna be. And again, this was the shift, this was the reflection. And so it happened in that order. Before we move on to the shortcut, just one really, really wanna highlight that tip I just shared with you. To find the vertex of a graph, or if it doesn't have a vertex, wherever the graph sort of starts, you can always set the input equal to zero and solve. That will always work. It's going to be a really helpful thing to use, like, for example, in trigonometry. Uh, if you were graphing cosine of 5x plus 30, and you wanted to know where that graph began on the x-axis, you could set 5x minus 30 equal to zero. And quickly solve to figure out that your graph should actually start at 6 on the x-axis. So the cosine graph would have its first maximum. Instead of at 0, it would happen at 6 on the x-axis. Uh, and, you know, you'd have to do some other work to figure out the rest of the numbers. But that's a really powerful tool, uh, either for starting to make your graph or for just checking if your graph is correct. Uh, because if you, you know, solve and you get that it's 6, but then you, you put made your graph and the graph had started at 3, you know something has gone wrong. So really, really use that tip a lot. It's very helpful. At this point, if you are, unless you are completely 100,000% confident in all of those problems, please stop watching the video and go practice some multiple input transformations. There's something special about actually doing the transformations with your pencil and your paper that you can't get by what, just watching a video. So please stop and go practice. And when you come back, we'll talk about a shortcut. Here's the shortcut. Turns out that you can change the order of transformation by changing the equation using algebra. If you factor all the coefficients off of the inside, and they'll stay inside the function, but there will be an added set of parentheses. I'll show you what it looks like. You can do the transformations in the opposite order. You can do your reflections first, then your stretches, then your shifts. And you can still, these two can actually be switched, but it really, it lets you do the shift last, uh, which is not such a big deal. But what really helps me is that stretches are much easier to do when they are happen before a shift. Let me show you. We're going to do the same three examples, 
in with this new strategy of factor, then reflect, stretch, and shift. All right. So we're going to factor, then reflect, stretch, and shift. I'm going to keep these parentheses on the outside as a cube. But I notice that there's a one half attached to the x. So what I'm going to do is pull that one half out of the x minus one uh, and sort of create a new bracket in here. So I'm going to write it as one half and eh, we'll do a bracket in here just to signify it, it can be a parenthesis also just to, to signify the different um, orders of thing in here x minus and then when I pull that one half out I actually am dividing by one half and so this is going to become x minus 2 to the third you can multiply the half back in to see if you did that right um, although it's kind of going backwards then now we can do this first and this minus two second. So I'll start with the parent graph of x cubed. Looks like this. The one half is still a horizontal stretch or expansion. So the horizontal expansion moves the points that were at x equals one to x equals two and it keeps zero at zero. But notice how much easier for me, at least for me, that was to do than stretching it after it's been moved seems much easier to stretch it before you move it. Now we can do the shift. Uh, so if I move that in, uh, move that over, now notice that when I factored it out, I actually got the minus two. So when I do the shift, I'm gonna move everything over two units. But I just move them straight over two. I don't have to like count or divide, just go straight over two units, everything goes. And that's actually the graph that we had before. Here was the sequence from the other example that we did previously, where we um, shifted, then stretched. And here we are back at the example where we stretched and shifted. Same result, different procedure. Uh, it kind of just depends on what you prefer. Um, briefly, without going into too much detail on why that works, uh, we can still think about the idea of setting the argument equal to zero, but if I have factored the argument and I'm trying to solve that equal to zero, well, I'm not going to subtract two first. That would be illegal. I mean, yeah, that wouldn't be legal. Instead, I need to cancel that one half by multiplying both sides by two. That's the stretch part. Then those would reduce out. That's like times two, not squared. That's still zero. And you get X minus two equals zero. Then you add the two, that's the shift, uh, but now the shift happens second because we change the order that you would solve that equation, which lets you change the order of the transformations. That's why that works. Do you need to think about it? Like, do you anything to think about it that way? No, not really. Let's revisit the second example with the same idea. Uh, now I have a negative under the root, but I'm still just gonna leave the root as is and think about this as a set of parentheses. Uh, but I'm going to pull out that negative. You can think about like pulling out a negative one if it helps you. And it would become negative one X minus four under that root. Now working from outside in, we reflect and then shift. And also notice that when I pulled out the negative, the direction of the shift changed. Um, because we change the order, we change the direction of the shift as well. We're going to get the same result though. Here's the parent graph. Now if I reflect it, it's much easier to reflect this graph because I just like fold it in half. I mirror it. And then I shift it, but now I have a minus here, so I'm shifting to the right. So I just take all those points and I go four units to the right. And that again is the same graph we did before. Is it easier for you? Maybe it's easier for me. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. If you don't like this idea of factoring, then don't use this method. Use the other way. Um, and just completely forget about this that, this, that I ever showed you this. I'm just trying to give you options here. It's always nice to have options. Uh, so let's do example three with this last option. So again, absolute value. But if I sort of imagine a set of parentheses here, and as, if that's a term, I can pull out a negative and a two. 
So it would be something like negative 2 parentheses x minus 3. Think about multiplying that 2 back in and confirm that you would get plus 6 in that case. So now we're going to do a reflection. We're going to do a uh, shrink. And then we're going to do the shift. And this one I think is really nice to do that, uh, sh that reflection first. Here's the parent graph of absolute value. You're going to reflect that over the y-axis. You can do it. Nothing changes because this uh, absolute value has a symmetry already. So it turns out in this case that when you, when you think about it in this order, the reflection doesn't actually do anything. Uh, we're still going to get the proper result here. Now we're going to shrink by dividing all the x's by 2. So I'll move all the x values in by that factor of 2. And again, 0 now doesn't move, so the vertex is staying the same. That's really nice. And I can see I've kind of got a slope of 2 going now. And now that I have that slope of 2, I have my nice v. I'm going to shift it over 3 units. Again, the direction of the shift changed here, so I'm going to shift to the right instead of shifting to the left like I did in the original. But that gets me to the same place that I had in uh, the original when we, when we did it 10 minutes ago. And there's the result. So by factoring the inside, you can actually change the way the equation looks, but also change the order of transformations uh, in a way that might make it easier for you. So to recap, uh, if you're doing transformations in the standard order, you should do horizontal shifts, horizontal stretches, and then any reflections over the y-axis. That's the first big idea. The second big idea of this video is that to find the vertex or starting point of a graph, you can set the argument equal to zero and solve. That will tell you where that point has transformed or moved to, uh, and that will take care of any weird like order operation stuff. Third big idea is that if you do want a shortcut, you can try factoring the inside and changing the order uh, once you've factored it to reflecting, stretching, and shifting in that order. And then you'll get graphs that look like this. That's it for today, folks. Please let me know what questions you have. Uh, good luck on your practice problems, and I'll see you all next time.